let me start with uh, thanking Dr. Rajiv Chawla and Dr. Sharlini Jaggi and the uh, organizers, and also thank you, Arvinda, for the kind words. I know you have a star-studded international faculty as well. It's been my pleasure to participate in almost all these meetings over the last uh, few years, and heartiest congratulations on the ninth edition of the International Symposium on Diabetes. So my topic is uh, precision diabetes care. The time is now, and I know that about half an hour later, Dr. Ranjit Tonikrishnan is also going to talk on monogenic diabetes. There can be some overlap between these two, but I think his will be mostly a clinical uh, talk about how to diagnose monogenic diabetes. And mine is a little bit more broad. I don't have any conflict of interest to declare. The studies are supported mainly by ICMR, but also some by DBT, DST, and also by the National Institute of Health Research, NHR, in the UK. So I'd like to start at the beginning about what is precision diabetes and what is personalized medicine. Uh, precision medicine, personalized medicine. In the case of diabetes, be precision diabetes and personalized diabetes. Now, there are many definitions, but for me, this one is my own simple definition. If you try to have the other, I mean, I remember many years ago, I gave a talk on uh, not exactly precision diabetes, that word had not yet been used, but I was talking about why you should distinguish different types of diabetes. And I know that Dr. Anup Mishra had put out at that time a beautiful, uh, you know, flow chart showing that not all type 2 patients should be treated the same. There are lean people and there are obese people and so different kinds of treatment. And I was trying to put all this together and a colleague of mine came up after the talk and he said, why are you confusing everyone? Give everyone metformin. That doesn't work. Give uh, sulfonylurea. That doesn't work. You give something else. DPP, but that doesn't work. Give something else. That's it. Finished. Very simple. Why are you confusing the world with saying there are so many types of diabetes and all that? If nothing else works, give insulin. That's it. Then I said, okay, then my, you know, security guard can also treat. He can pick a lottery and say which one we should treat. So bringing science into it and whatever science you have, and you saw the extensive science, which Dr. Anup Mishra just presented uh, uh, before, uh, before me. And uh, so when you bring all that science together, then in the future, and even today, I would say, uh, our brain itself tells us, don't even need artificial intelligence and so on, tells us that this particular patient this particular drug seems to be good. Heart failure, SGLT2, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but there's also the role of environment and genetics and all this put together based on science. You say this particular uh, diagnosis seems to be the precision diabetes. And for that, this particular treatment seems to be good. But then what happens is that there is also a person with diabetes in the center of all this. And that person may say, all that is fine, but I don't like this. You know, I, I refuse to take this. Now, what do you do? Uh, so you'll have to also take the patient's social context and preferences and all that into account. Because after all, we are not treating a robot, nor are we robots treating. So we have to take the patient's needs, affordability, and many other things into consideration. And that makes it personalized. Today, we are not in a stage where everybody for every disease can get personalized medicine, but we are slowly but steadily approaching that. Um, the ADA and EASD Precision Medicine and Diabetes Initiative was started somewhere in late uh, 2019 and by 2020, uh, they had a committee. I'm very happy that uh, I have been inducted into this committee. Practically every week uh, we meet on various aspects. And stuff. In fact, initially about uh, if, uh, in the executive committee, uh, mostly there were people only from uh, from US and from um, Europe. Uh, but then they, in their wisdom, they then realized that India and China are very important because 40% of the whole world's uh, people with diabetes come from these two countries. So they very kindly inducted me and my good friend, Dr. Lenon Ji uh, from China. Uh, so to get a broader perspective on this. And so we have come up with this international perspective and future vision. The whole idea is that Precision medicine and diabetes itself is divided into type 1, type 2, monogenic diabetes, GDM. And for each of them, we have a precision diagnosis and precision uh, treatment and precision prognosis and, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are different, different groups working on it. We're going to come up with a series of white papers, which hopefully next year will be published as a series of uh, papers. Well, today, in the interest of time, I'll talk a little bit about type 2 diabetes, but there I think the field is very rapidly exploding. I'm not talking about type 1 diabetes because that's still a work in progress, although considerable amount of work is being done on that. 
And then I'll talk about uh, the monogenic diabetes and neonatal diabetes, what you should know, and we'll try to avoid overlap with what uh, Dr. Ranjit will be talking soon. Now, this field of type 2 diabetes, we all knew for a long time, and we in India, led by uh, Dr. Anup Mishra, actually came up with the thing long ago that if you have insulin resistance as a main thing, you consider a drug like a sensitizer like metformin. Whereas if you have insulin secretory defect, uh, you take, you can give a sulfonylurea, DPP-4, these may be people who need insulin faster and so on. But the field really took off after Leaf Group and colleagues published this very nice paper uh, in 2018, classifying type 2 diabetes into different types. But of, I'll straight away hasten to add, that the first type that they introduced into this is nearly not type 2 diabetes. It's a variant of type 1, what we used to call as LADA, the severe autoimmune diabetes. So that you can exclude straight away in the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. But the other four, uh, which they describe, are very interesting and very novel. First is where insulin deficiency seems to be the main defect. We know that in type 2 diabetes, you have both insulin deficiency as well as insulin resistance. But in some, the deficiency stands out. And this seems to be more common in Asians, South Asians, Japanese, and so on. Whereas a severe insulin resistant form, where you have severe obesity and uh, the fat, which uh, Dr. Anupin is talking about, and so on, is more in this variety, the SIRDD variety, although there's overlap between all the three. They had another variety called mild obesity diabetes. There's no insulin resistance, but there's obesity. We do see this, but this is not the commonest form that we see in India. And the last one is a mild age-related diabetes. So these four types were described uh, by them. So we wanted to see whether this can be applied to Indians. And the reason for that is many people uh, who are also speakers in this uh, meeting, for example, have worked on this uh, phenomenon of uh, the Asian Indian uh, phenotype. And which consists of lower age at onset type 2 diabetes. The BMI threshold is lower. That means you don't have to get obesity as in obesity to get diabetes. And then there's insulin resistance. Number four and five are very important to me because there's a rapid decline in beta cell function, which occurs much more rapidly in our population. Therefore, the progression from pre diabetes to diabetes and from normal glucose tolerance to pre diabetes and diabetes occurs much more rapidly in our population. Number five to me is very important because this is one of the hallmarks of the South Asian uh, or the or the Indian, Asian Indian phenotype, the very low HDL levels that we have and the high triglyceride and the small dense LDL. Of course, there are many, many others, including the thin fat Indian about which Dr. Yajnik will be talking and, and many others, which actually Dr. Anup Mishra also just talked about. So given this, we said, okay, let's see whether those four types fit in exactly in our population. This was a collaborative study between our MDRF and the University of Dundee in Scotland. And this is what is called as the INSPIRED study. And INSPIRED stands for India-Scotland Partnership for Precision Medicine in, in Diabetes, funded by the uh, NIHR in the UK. We published this uh, two years ago in BMJ Open, and we described it as novel subgroups of type 2 diabetes and association microvascular outcome. Now, let me tell you how we went about it. First thing that we did was we took the exact criteria, the exact K clustering and everything as was done in Scandinavia. Our objective was not to disprove them, but to prove them. But then we found, and it's there in the paper for those who want to read, it was all over the place. We just could not get their system falling in exactly in the Scandinavian uh, system, falling into their four or five subtypes. When we tried to replicate in India, it's going all over the place because our phenotype is so different. Having given up after several attempts and shown how what comes out, we use their clustering. We then thought, let's bring in some of our own thing. And that's why we added the HDL, the low HDL and the triglycerides. The moment we did that, everything fitted in very nicely. And where did we get this data from? We had two sources. In the first set, we took our own clinic patients, about 20,000 of them. The original Scandinavian group had about 8,000. We took about 20,000 people, relatively newly diagnosed within first five years of diagnosis and from different states of the country. And then we use this K clustering and machine learning to see what kind of clusters come. We then replicated this in the INDIAB study. You know that the INDIAB study samples the whole country, 124,000 people representative of India's 1.36 billion. I'm happy to say that the study is now over and the next phases of INDIAB have just started. Now, when we went to INDIAB, when we use the clinic data, because we have C peptide and all that, we use that. We use HOMA beta, HOMA ARC peptide, everything was clinic. Phenotyping is much stronger than an epidemiological study. 
But when we tried to scale it up to the whole of the country, we simplified it. We just made it age of diagnosis, BMI, waist, HbA1c, triglyceride, and HDL. Now, this will be available in any clinic. If any of you want to do that using the simple criteria, uh, we can do that. What did we find? We found the same in both the clinic population as well as the Indiab population. And subsequently, we did it in another clinic population where we took samples from many of you, about 10, 14 collaborators all over the country sent their data and we got the same results. So the results are consistent. What did we find? The first is the severe insulin deficient variety, which uh, Leaf Group had shown, is there in our country, but it's much more severe. 26% of people have that. It occurs at a much younger age. They're much thinner and they have much lower C-peptide and much more severe insulin deficiency. The insulin resistant variety was very different from what they had uh, what they described as SIRD. So we called it as IROD, which is a little different. And if you read the paper, we'll tell you the differences. But what is absolutely new and novel for the first time is this combined variety. Till we had reported this, there was no report in the world literature of a combined insulin resistant and deficient variety. And these people had the lowest HDL cholesterol and the highest triglycerides of the, all the four groups. So this seemed to be a truly South Asian or a truly Asian Indian phenotype. And then of course, we had the mild age-related one. Difference from Scandinavia was that their age-related was 65 plus. Our age-related was 50 plus, 15 years lower. So even the MARD or mild age-related, there were significant differences from Scandinavia. Now you may say, what is the clinical significance of this? Why don't you just treat like my colleague told me, just give them metformin yeah, for everybody and that doesn't work. Throw in one DPP or whatever your choice or whatever your next comes to your mind, you throw that in. That's it. Diabetes treatment is so simple. Now, the one of the things that came out in, in the Scandinavian study and we were able to exactly replicate that is the insulin deficient variety is more prone to retinopathy. That's what they showed and that's what we also showed. Whereas the insulin resistant variety, they did not find to be more prone to retinopathy. And we also found the same. But remember, we had a third group, the CIRDD. Now, what did we find there? Now, the MARD is actually taken as a reference. Okay. So, what we found was that the CIRDD was prone to retinopathy. It was also prone to nephropathy. Now, am I surprised by that? No, because they have insulin deficiency as well as insulin resistant. So, to cut a long story short, the more insulin deficient people are more prone to neuropathy and retinopathy, whereas the more insulin resistant ones are more prone to kidney disease, liver fat, and to cardiovascular disease. And CIRDD, interestingly enough, is prone to both retinopathy as well as to nephropathy. There was one other difference. If you try to treat them with whatever treatment which is given and see how long they took to get to HbA1c of 7% or below, the MARD variety, the mild age-related one, they are the mild type they got easily controlled. The most difficult to control was the severe insulin deficient variety. And the next difficult was the red one, which is the CIRDD. Am I surprised? No, because they have insulin deficiency. And many of them have not been given insulin. They've been treated, this is a retrospective study. So we treated them the usual way. And that's why we find, you will all find in your practice, some people respond better, some people don't respond. That's because they have more insulin deficiency and you're not giving them the proper secretagogue, okay? Now, how do you detect this in a clinic? It took us some time, but we have now developed this software called as DIANA. And DIANA stands for Diabetes Novel Subgroup Assessment. Now, what you do, this is developed in-house by us. And what you do here is that you just put in the age, BMI, waste. If you have C-peptide, and you can add that. Otherwise, you have HDL triglyceride, you can just put that. Immediately, within a second, the software will tell you which type of diabetes you're treating in that particular patient. In this particular case, it has said that this is a case of SIDD. It tells you what is the five-year risk of developing retinopathy and nephropathy. It also suggests that perhaps you should consider a low-dose sulfonylurea, a DPP4 inhibitor, or you may even give insulin if the HbA1c is very high. To my knowledge, it's the first time that clustering of type 2 diabetes using a simple program has been developed anywhere in the world, which also tells you what is the risk of developing complications. It also prompts you what treatment you can give. Of course, it's up to you to decide what treatment to give. I'm very happy to tell you that this clustering has now been replicated 
in South Asians in the UK, in Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. In this particular report, there were no Indians. They were all Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. It was published in PLOS Medicine two, three months ago. And what they've reported is that the possibility of combined insulin resistant and deficient etiology has now been replicated by us. We are able to reproduce these subtypes which Dr. Anjana described. So therefore, it is not just an Indian phenomenon. It is a South Asian phenomenon. There are no Indians in this at all. And in, South, uh, in, in the UK, among the South Asians, this has now been confirmed. In fact, the CIRDD, the combined one, has also been now re recently replicated in China as well. And a review article has now been written on this on all the clustering, showing that in Asians, this CIRDD seems to be a, a unique one. Let me now move on to the topic of monogenic diabetes, because this is where day in and day out, we use precision medicine uh, to treat our patients. Now, maturity onset diabetes of the young or MODI, you know, as a type of diabetes comes at young age, it looks that they may have type 1 diabetes because they are thin, but they don't develop ketosis and they seem to respond to tablets. 14 types were originally described, of which today using the ACMG uh, criteria, uh, and uh, the the, uh, the final classification of Modi, the Modi 7, 9, and 11 have now been dropped. They are no longer considered Modi. So there are 11 types of diabetes. And we have written several articles on how they should be diagnosed and reviews and so on. I won't go into that. But the question you may ask is, why bother about this Modi at all? If I show you a case, uh, and this girl actually came back to me now, uh, after her 25 years after we started her on this treatment. So she was 16 years old when she first came to us, thin, had HbA1c of 10.4, and automatically because she's thin, severe diabetes, 16 years old, she, somebody diagnosed her to have uh, type 1 diabetes, and she was started on three times insulin. As would, uh, as you can imagine, children with uh, or parents of type 1 children go around, you know, uh, shopping to different uh, endocrinologists and diabetologists saying, is there any way you can stop insulin? So this child also landed up uh, there. And we don't normally give a promise. We'll say, let's study and we'll tell you what it is. Now, the first thing we do is to draw a family history, not do the genetics first. We first draw the family history. That's a proband. Her mother had diabetes. Many of her aunts had, and even some of her cousins had diabetes. Everyone in red is has diabetes. So with that, we then went on to uh, study her further. We found that her C-peptide was nowhere in the type 1 range. She had much better C-peptide than any of our type 1s. Then we did the GAD antibodies and the zinc transporter, which we routinely do, and it was negative. So we said, okay, this is a good chance. And then she has such a strong family history, three-generation transmission, which is common in Modi. So we said, let's do Modi genetic testing. This is a few years ago, 2009, we already published this. So you can see that this, we found the HNF1 alpha mutation, which is a Modi 3. So arginine to histidine, a mutation. This is done in our lab. And what we found was by that time, her sister also developed diabetes. So we quickly tested her and she also had Modi 3. So she had, her sister had, her mother had, her aunts had, and even her cousin who was some 14 years old, he also had Modi 3. So this is a whole family of Modi 3. Now the beauty of Modi 3 or HNF1 alpha is that they respond to self malurias. So what did we do? We took the patient off insulin completely started her on glybenzamide, which is the commonest self malaria used. We're also now doing a trial on glycoside. The HbA1c came down to 6.8, and she's still responding to glybenzamide after several years. As I said, she just came back, uh, and 25 years later, she's still doing very well. So this is a classical example of how if we apply a mind and pick up, we might be able to find out cases which are not really type 1 diabetes and then treat them uh, using the principles of precision diabetes. Now, if you thought that that was dramatic, even much more dramatic is this condition called as neonatal diabetes, which is onset of diabetes below six months of age. There are two types, the transient variety, which comes before six months, but by the first birthday, it's gone. It may come back later on during adolescence or adults, but it goes away immediately. Permanent neonatal diabetes is more common in our experience because the transient ones probably don't get referred that much. But permanent neonatal diabetes, we get constant referrals. Almost every day, I'll get a call from some part of the country that there is a child with neonatal diabetes. So this occurs before six months and it doesn't go away. Okay. So let me again illustrate this with a case study. This is a three-month-old uh, female baby who came to us eight or nine years ago, I think, from Calcutta. She was diagnosed to have diabetes two weeks after birth. That means just newborn child. She was started on insulin, but she was given 14 units of insulin, which is 3.5 kg per body, units per kg body weight, high dose. 
and it was not responding. Four times a day she was injected. Blood sugars remain 300 to 400. So worried, the parents came to us. The first thing we did was, we said below six months of age, we have to do genetic testing because that is neonatal diabetes. That's mandatory now. American Diabetes Association and everybody recommends that. We did the genetic testing and we were happy when she had this particular mutation, the KCNJ11 mutation. And this is the glycine to valine mutation that she had. Now we were happy because the KCNJ11 mutation, as well as the ABCC8 mutation, which are the commonest mutations in permanent neonatal diabetes, respond to sulfonylurea. So what we did was we started her on glybenthlamide, and this is what happened. Slowly, green is the sulfonylurea dose. Slowly, we increase the dose of the sulfonylurea. The dose of insulin was brought down, as you can see, and by fourth day, it became zero. Look at the blood sugars. When she was on insulin, sugars not under control. As the sulfonylurea dose was increased, blood sugars came to near normal blood sugars. And so this is uh, a classic example of how doing a genetic test, which is part of precision medicine, of course, was able to completely change the prognosis for this particular child. This is Ivana when she came, when she was uh, just two weeks old. Today, she's, uh, I think, eight or nine years old, and she's doing extremely well. She's not had a single shot of insulin since that time that we made the diagnosis of diabetes. She's growing very well, and she's doing really well. The first report of some 30 cases of uh, neonatal diabetes we published 10 years ago, but today we have a very large series. And if you have, as I said, the KCNJ or the ABCC8 mutations, now these are the HbA1c levels when insulin was given, but after changing sulfonylurea, you can see they've come down to normal and the blood sugars have come down to normal. Now we also, when we do the genetic testing, we also pick up other things. For example, they may come like a ordinary type one diabetes. But when you do the genetic testing, we'll find out it's walcott rollison syndrome. You may ask, what does it matter? Well, children with walcott rollison syndrome don't live beyond their 18th birthday, whereas somebody with type 1 diabetes can live up to 90 years of age. The oldest I know of is 90 years of age. So it's a complete change in the prognosis once you make the, the diagnosis of this. Did mode where hearing will go, diabetes insipidus comes, and mid thiamine and responsive megaloblastic anemia. You just give time in, the anemia goes away and the diabetes goes away. It's, it's very dramatic. You have to see these cases to believe it. Now, we have a large series now, 1,562 cases of uh, monogenic diabetes in our uh, case series, 315 neonatal diabetes, 76 syndromic forms. MODI 983 are the referred ones. Not all have the genetic mutation. Look at hypoglycemia, almost 200 cases of hypoglycemia diagnosed just after birth, like neonatal diabetes, much more difficult to treat. Neonatal diabetes is very easy to treat. Congenital hypoglycemia is a nightmare. Some will respond to disoxide, some will need octreotide, some need pancreatectomy. By doing the genetic test, we can say who needs which. And today we have a kind of lookup table. Based on the ge genetics, we can tell you which kind of response will occur in congenital hypoglycemia. In fact, if you take them all together, MODI, neonatal syndromic and congenital, we are probably one of the few centers in the world which is doing all of them. We are a nodal center for monogenic diabetes testing, and we get cases from all over the country, including at least 50 or 60 medical colleges and pediatric institutes keep referring to us. We have set up a registry for this, a monogenic diabetes registry, which is constantly being updated. So I'd like to end, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that precision diabetes is slowly coming of age. It can be applied to all forms of diabetes, including type 1. But type 2 is where the field is moving very rapidly forward. There are four clusters in India, the SID variety, the MARD variety, the IROD variety, and the SERD variety. We are doing a randomized clinical trial right now, following the pathophysiology of these four types and seeing which drug responds better uh, to which particular treatment. The recruitment is just getting over, and hopefully in a few months we'll be able to publish for the first time based on the accurate diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, a randomized clinical trial using metformin as starting point, the control arm, and using the specific drug uh, in the intervention arm. Study of monogenic diabetes has helped people to go off insulin. And precision diagnosis helps uh, precision treatment. All children, if you want one message from this lecture, all children with di di is diagnosed below six months of age must undergo genetic testing. You may say, well, they can't afford it. We'll do it free. Just send it to us. Nobody asks for one rupee. Anyone in India has any child below six months of age, just send it to me. 
three, four weeks time will give you the result without one rupee being charged to you. Neonatal diabetes, the ABCCA and KCNJ11 can be transferred to sulfonylureas. Now we have hundreds of cases which are now being transferred uh, to sulfonylureas and insulin being completely stopped. So it's nothing short of a miracle as far as the child and the family is concerned. All this is possible because of a huge team that we have. This is our genetics team read, uh, headed by Dr. Radha Venkateshan. Uh, this particular team alone has 139 publications on the genomics of diabetes, various forms of genomics, and 15 PhDs have already been completed and a few more are now doing the PhDs. So I'm very proud of this particular team who work very closely with the clinical team. And therefore, from the lab to the gen to the clinic and from the clinic to the lab is something, a kind of an unique integration which uh, we have brought about, which has helped to change the lives of children with uh, diabetes, with monogenic diabetes. And with that, I'd like to stop. And if there are any questions, we'll take it up. Thank you very much.